Giadeva Karja, because the Fauci Rave, go Hig Balyakia, the Sulagam, go one in Shivalan Salsa, Ashen Tourisk, go Gian Car. So, in English, that was the Irish language. That's our, our own secret little language. If you're not from Ireland or uh, ha, ha, speak Irish, I just wanted to welcome you, all, welcome you all to Dublin, and I hope you've enjoyed your, your visit here to Dublin. So as Jan says, my name is Brian Honan, and I'm going to talk to you about this alleged Chinese curse. Uh, a famous saying is that, may you live in interesting times. And... Uh, uh, when you look at it, when you say, may, may you live in interesting times, it's two connotations. One is that it's a blessing. You live in interesting times, things are happy, things are happening for the benefit of you, you're enjoying life, there's lots of interesting things happening, and you have a good time. However, it's also known as a curse, because you live in interesting times, there's a lot of bad stuff happening, and your life is interesting as a result. So... I think very much from a cybersecurity point of view, we do live in interesting times. Particularly now, and I'm going to go through some slides, and I know some of it may be stuff you're very well familiar with, but I just want to build up a picture of where we are as an industry today and where that industry may be going and what I think we need to do together as an industry to, to, to work on that. We have a saying in Irish, it's called a mehel. Uh, mehel is a tradition in amongst Irish farmers where you all got together as a community to work and help each other. So if you're a farmer and you need to bring your crops in and you don't have enough in, people in your family or, or, or staff on your farm, you can form a mehel with neighboring farmers and they'll come and help you with that, with that crop. And when they need something done, you return the favor and work back together. And I think as an industry, we need to have what I like to call a cyber mehel that we can all work together as an industry to, to meet the challenges that are, are, are rapidly coming our way. So this is from the, global, uh, the World Economic Forum's Global Risk uh, uh, Research, which was uh, released January of this year. So you can see two things there that are high on the list of the current risk landscape to all the global economy and businesses. First one is AI-generated misinformation and disinformation. And I think anybody who is on Twitter will, be, will bear witness to, to a lot of that happening. And the number five risk, cyber attacks. And I think this is where we historically and regularly we're seeing that in our industry. We've seen that happening, but it's now becoming more and more apparent to those outside of cyber and outside of IT. The business leaders are now seeing this. And the top 10 risks they see that are happening over the next, so the column on your left is what they see in the next two years, and the column on the right are the risks they see in the next 10 years. So again, misinformation and disinformation is right up there, number one. And the main reason for that being number one is because I think I read a statistic in the next this year and next year, there's something like 120 elections globally happening. You know, so here in Ireland, there's talk about elections happening, and uh, our government has to have an election call by March 2025. But they're also saying because they gave, they, they're doing so well, they may call the election in the next few weeks. You'll have the U.S. elections. So there's a lot of stuff happening. We've, we've seen the U.K. elections happening. And cyber insecurity is the fourth risk there as well. Now, fast forward 10 years, we can still see misinformation, disinformation being a key risk. Also, adverse outcomes of AI technologies. So, you know, like, I've been in the industry a long time. When I started working in IT in the 1980s, one of my teammates was actually the AI uh, guru for the company I worked with. And we were an insurance company, so we were looking at AI back then and how to sell insurance policies. And we still have AI much further. I also come from an agricultural background. And AI, when I was growing up, was for artificial insemination. So when I see AI uh, outcomes, adverse outcomes of AI technologies, it has a different picture in my head happening than maybe what many of you may have. But also, look at that. Eighth risk is cyber insecurity. You know, so try, cast your mind back 10 years ago. 2014, what was the technology like then? And what was, how did businesses 
depend on technology then and what do they do? Cast your mind forward 10 years and try and project what, how that difference may be. Do you think if COVID had happened in 2014, would as many companies have survived with remote working, et cetera, as did when COVID did happen? So, you know, we are becoming more and more dependent on the internet and our technology as societies, as businesses, as economies as well. We're seeing adverse effects as well from, from geopolitical uh, conflicts around the world. The Ukraine, Russian, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we have seen a lot of uh, new attacks and new malware and uh, wiper malware, et cetera, come out of that, that conflict. And I know many of you in this room and many of your companies have been heavily involved in that. And I thank you for all the hard work you've all been doing on that as well. We're seeing the same thing with the uh, conflict in the Middle East. Now, you may say, Brian, what has that got to do, with, for example, we're here in Dublin, Ireland. What has the conflict in the Middle East got to do with companies here in Ireland? Three months ago, a water scheme in Mayo on, in the west of Ireland was taken offline by a cyber attack. Pro-Palestinian hackers took down their service. A hundred houses had no water for a week because the systems being used to manage and filter and look after the water were, were being provided by an Israeli company. And the pro-Palestinian uh, uh, hackers took down that water system, not because it was Irish or not because of anything else, but purely because it was Israeli technology and was taken it offline. So although these conflicts may be geographically happening elsewhere in the world, they're also happening on the internet, close to, closer to home than we might, might think. So these are, are threats that we have to face. And we're seeing lots and lots of more threats happening, uh, you know, cloud computing threats. Just look at the attacks against Microsoft uh, 365 by Russia and China that happened a few, a few months ago, and how many companies were not aware that they potentially were being hacked because the Microsoft underlying infrastructure had been compromised. And as more and more business are engaging with the cloud, more and more governments are engaging with the cloud, the potential for harm and potential for risk is increasing a lot more as well. The Internet of Things is happening more and more. Hands up who's got a Fitbit or some sort of uh, a fit thing on their, on their hands and wrists. Yeah, so we're all connected to the Internet. Yay, the Internet knows where we are at the moment. It knows when we're active, it knows when we're asleep. It's like Santa Claus. You know, it knows when we're good, it knows when we're bad. Yeah, of course I didn't have any burgers for lunch. I had a healthy salad. No brand new watch tells you something different. So internet things is happening. We've got medical devices being connected to the internet. Insulin pumps, uh, heart pacemakers. All these things are being connected to the internet and all bringing risks. I was in... Sadly, I couldn't attend yesterday or, yet, uh, or the day before because I was over in London, but I did attend talks this afternoon in the Red Room, and uh, uh, one talk was, a, was about solar panels. And this gentleman's actually sitting in the, <laughs> in the front row there. Uh, the, the risk that we, you know, it's connected to the internet. We've all these solar panels on our houses, and they're connected to the internet. So what security is around those devices? How secure are, is our energy uh, grid, be that the larger one or indeed our own personal ones from these solar panels, how secure are those? And what do we need to do to make them more secure? But our houses are getting more connected. Smart bulbs, smart lights, smart, t smart fridges, smart TVs, smart alarms, all being connected to the internet. All, no doubt, vulnerable and exposed. Our smart cars. More and more technology you put into these cars, tracking and tracing them, etc., more uh, risk happening there as well. And this comes from the Irish Revenue Service, our, our, our beautiful, pe wonderful people in the tax office. Never slag off tax people, by the way, folks. They're always, the, they're always nice people to keep, to keep them happy. But they issued an edict to all their staff that when working remotely, do not talk about sensitive client information in front of smart speakers. So you're... Alexas, your Google Homes, or whatever, keep them, uh, keep, don't, don't speak of anything 
uh, sensitive or uh, worrisome in front of those. And then we have artificial intelligence. As I said earlier on, we talked about AI, et cetera, and, and the different connotations. But AI is bringing us many benefits. It can bring us a lot of computing power that we can look at and do research into diseases and, and everything else, but also brings threats. Now, how I'm still on the, on the fence as to how uh, AI will be used in an offensive way. So far, personally, all I'm aware of and I've seen is just better uh, spam and better emails written and also maybe um, uh, videos and, and, and voice. But a lot of those are being used for fraud. And, you know, is, is business email compromise, is that a cyber issue or is that more financial and accounting process and procedures, making sure that if you are going to send something to a new bank account belonging to a, a, a vendor, shouldn't your finance people not be verifying that in some way as opposed to relying that it came on via an email or a video call or a voicemail or a, or a WhatsApp message? But it will bring us many challenges. Uh, and artificial times we're going to have to, to deal with that. Quantum computing is also going to bring us lots of benefits and bring us many leaps forward in how we do things and why we do things. Uh, again, but it's also going to be giving us lots of challenges. Are we prepared from a security point of view to live and work in a post-quantum environment? What about all the encryption we've been so wonderfully putting in place today that when quantum technology comes along, it's going to completely make uh, redundant. So we have a lot of... Uh, Interesting times ahead with regards to all the technology, etc., that is happening. Just bringing it back more to tech, you know, away from the technology aspect. When we talk about cyber, when we talk about security, cyber security or IT security, whatever you want to call it, immediately we jump to networks, computers, maybe some people might leap to data. But we very rarely talk about the human aspect of all this. So here in Ireland, we had a ransomware attack against our health service executive, the HSE. This is the government body that manages and runs every public hospital in the country, every public clini health clinic in the country, and many surgeries, etc. Conti attacked the HSE and took down the whole computing system for the HSC. So our hospitals had no computers, full stop, boom. No computers, no patient records available, no x-rays available, no MRI scans. We had patients arriving to hospitals for surgeries that were being turned away. We had patients arriving to hospital that the doctors didn't know what was wrong with them because they, they couldn't access the computers to find out what was what, what was the, the, the health, their health records were. We were relying on people to remember their, their own diagnosis and, you know, going back to payments. So there was a, that was a major, major impact, not to mention that the criminals also stole the, the personal data belonging to patients and published online the medical data of 100,000 Irish citizens. Think about the psychological impact that would have on you as one of those victims that your medical information is now online and publicly available. This is the personal impact. You know, we didn't care about computers. When this happened in this country, we didn't care about the computers. We wanted to get the hospitals back running and we wanted to get the patients healthy again. This is the impact cybercrime can have. And of the examples as well of, of a few more things, the, that Danish CEO, uh, he ran, uh, uh, forgive me, I can't remember his name, uh, but he ran a small cloud hosting firm in Denmark. Got hit by ransomware. Could not pay the ransom because a small business did not have the money to pay the ransom. As a result, his business, his company went out of business. But not only his company went out of business, think about the customers that relied on that cloud hosting provider. Their data, 
their websites, their systems, all became unavailable as well. We have there in the right hand, top right-hand side a Texas hospital had to turn away ambulances with patients in them because they got hit by a ransomware attack. Bottom left, this is from a recent article in the Irish Medical Times where a consultant said that the cyber attack, the one we just mentioned, the HC cyber attack of 2021, you can see the headline there, cyber attack had a, an effect on cancer care in Ireland worse than COVID did. Now, you don't have to cast our minds too far back to COVID and the disruption that that, that caused. Think about somebody in, the, in that profession saying this caused more disruption in cancer care in Ireland than COVID. He also, speaking at a conference, so it's not actually quoted in that paper, but he also spoke at a conference and he said he is very confident that people died due to lack of, 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 of care resulting from that, that ransomware attack on, on the HSC. And then the bottom right-hand corner there is a lady who was a cancer patient in London, and as you're probably aware, the, uh, the blood transfusion service and blood testing service for many of the London hospitals was outsourced to a private company. Uh, they got hit by ransomware. So all the blood testing and blood transfusion services being provided had to stop for many of those London hospitals. This lady had the choice between uh, does she go ahead with her surgery or not? And she had to make a choice. She actually chose to have her breast removed as a result of the doctors not having access to the, te to, 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 the, uh, to the data. So think again, psychologically, how that has impacted somebody's life and their family's life, that you had to face that, that call because some computer somewhere got hacked and hit ransomware. So I think we need to start thinking more about the societal and personal impact cyber attacks can have, and not just the impact it has on networks and on, on information. And I think as a result of this, and I know many people I talk to in, uh, in the industry are railing against, oh my God, the government is now stepping in with regulations. Well, regulation never stopped a hacker. Policies never stopped a hacker. We need more and more, more technology. Well, maybe. But governments are now st stepping back and thinking, we can't let this continue on as it is. You know? We need to do something. So here, in the, here is some of the upcoming legislation relating to cybersecurity in the EU alone. So we're probably all well familiar with the top one there, the EU General, De General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR. Everybody's favorite. Yay! We can't do that because of GDPR. Uh, the next one, the Network Information Security Directive, version 2, comes into effect October the 17th this year. So in two weeks' time, NIST 2 is going to be, be come into force, and that means every regulated entity has to have a minimum set of cybersecurity standards. Not only that, they also have to manage the cyber risk within their supply chain. So that means every business that supplies those regulated entities have to be able to prove they've taken the appropriate measures and appropriate steps to improve and manage cybersecurity in their organizations. And for many of you in this audience, how many of you have heard of the EU Cyber Resilience Act? Hands up. One, two, three, four. Okay, Cyber Resilience Act, just in case you're not aware, if you want to sell software or hardware products into the EU market, you're going, your product and your service is going to have to meet a minimum standard of cybersecurity. Otherwise, your product will not be eligible to be sold within the EU. Now, the EU is the second largest market in the world, so just think on that. You also need to have in place a good vulnerability management program so that if a problem is found with your, with your product, a security problem is found with your product, that you have a process and policy in place to remediate that problem within established rules. And if you don't, your product will no longer be allowed. So it's like having a safety standard on, on your products. 
these are now going to be security standards that we're going to have to say, we're going to have to use. And I think, you know, I think governments and people are too tired of software companies giving pinky problems, uh, pinky promises that we take cybersecurity seriously and we're going to have these initiatives to make security into our products. But time and time again, we still find products out there with SQL injection attacks in them. And SQL injection attacks have been around since the 1990s and they're still there. Default user ID and passwords in them. You know, like we, these things have to move on, have to change. And unfortunately, I think the regulations is going to be one of the ways for us to, uh, to move. So we're living in interesting times, folks. And it's probably going to get even more interesting as well. And there's other things happening, you know. That was just the EU. We're seeing other uh, countries and regions looking at implementing their own standards as well, similar to what we've done here. PCI DSS, I know it's, it's, it's only focused on credit card data, but that's improving as well. And over time, we're seeing more and more drivers, external drivers, non-technical drivers, forcing our industry to take certain paths to, to improve our products and improve how we secure things. Cyber insurance is going to be a big one as well. So there's a lot of things happening in life. And we, we're seeing as, you know, in the U, U, US, you have the SEC have uh, brought forth a lot of mandatory reporting now from cybersecurity instances. And we're seeing that happening with the Sullivan CISO of you know, accused potential misleading investors. You know, so who wants to be a CISO anymore? <laughs> It's certainly going to be a challenge. The ex-Uber CISO, Joe Sullivan, why he, pretend, he nearly went, and had a, uh, went to jail as well. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of things happening. The governments around the world are getting tired of all this. And it kind of reminds me that this, this is my second keynote at Virus Bulletin. My first one was in 2017. And back then, uh, I talked about the airline industry and how maybe the cybersecurity industry needs to align itself with how the airline industry has evolved over the years in improving security and improving things as well. Thanks to Boeing, I can no longer use that talk. <laughs> so I had to think of something else to come up with. But it did remind me of, now this isn't, just in case you think this is a picture of me and my father, it's not, it's to, you know, use your uh, artistic minds to, to, to think about it. But it reminded me of a conversation I had with my late father about cars. My dad loved cars. I haven't followed in his footsteps. I just drive cars. I don't care what happens on the engine. As long as it goes, I don't care. But he loved cars. And we are having a chat about cars. And he was talking about how, when he was younger, how cars back in the 40s and 50s, were so unsafe. You know, they may have had seatbelts in them, but there were lap seatbelts. It wasn't compulsory to wear them. There was no heaters in the cars. You can see that there was a bench seat, uh, etc. There was a lot of things in those cars that wasn't safe. He actually told me the story of one of his neighbors who bought a brand new car and didn't spend the extra money to try and get heating put in the car. Instead, what he did was he cut a hole in the floor of the car and then he cut a hole into the exhaust pipe and fitted a flap so that when, the, when it got too cold, you lift the flap and the exhaust fumes will come into the car, heat the car up and we're all handy dandy. And you could put the flap down to, to cool it down. Now, that's a f I laugh when I heard that, but then think about it. Think about the users who use the IT systems and how we've gone, oh my God, stupid users. How could they do that? Did they not understand how it works? But I think what it's, that illustrates is a lack of understanding of the risks. Obviously, that individual at that time did not understand that what carbon monoxide poisoning could do to the human being and having your exhaust pipe coming straight into your cabin of your car is going to accelerate that process. So we have those things, you know, I think that's, we're kind of nearly there where, uh, in, in, our, in the IT environment. I'm not just picking on cybersecurity. I think IT, we have all this technology. We have people using smartphones, uh, tablets, computers, smart devices at home, and they just work. But they don't know how they work or why they work, and they assume they're safe. They assume 
that the products they've bought are secure by design and by default. They assume that there's been some sort of testing to verify that these things will, will, won't cause them any harm or any damage. But things have changed. Like, in order to improve road safety, we had things introduced. Like 1931, the UK introduced the first uh, rules of the road. Uh, so, you know, so think about it. We had the car industry, automobile industry, from the early 1900s to 1931 with no rules. Just drive whatever way you want, folks. Have fun and live on the edge. You know, kind of like IT today. Here's the internet. Have fun and live on the edge. Wipers. We take them as granted on our cars now, yeah? Who would buy a car with no wipers? Even if you lived in a country that <laughs> seldom saw rain, you would still have wipers on your car. They only came, became compulsory in the 1920s, 1930s. Laminate windscreens. So you hit something. It doesn't shatter into a million pieces and shred you to death when, 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 you, when you have a collision. They became compulsory in the 40s and 50s. Headrests. Now, by the way, headrests are not for you to rest your head. They're there to prevent whiplash. So if you, hit a, if you have a head-on collision or some sort of collision, when your head goes back, it doesn't go back all the way and cause you a neck injury. The headrest stops you there. That's what a headrest is for. Invented by Volvo. Optional extras until the 60s and 70s. This is probably, this gentleman here has probably saved more lives than anybody else in the, in, in the history. This is Niels Bolin. He invented the three-point seatbelt when he worked for Volvo. He also insisted that there be no patent or intellectual property rights put on his invention. So other car manufacturers could take on the three-point seatbelt. Now again, this was in the 1950s. I think it was New Zealand, or was it Australia, was, one of the, first, was the first country in the world to make seatbelts mandatory of driving in 1971. So 20 years after the invention of the three-point seatbelt, it became mandatory. Seatbelts became mandatory here in Ireland, I think, the late 70s, early 80s. So, you know, it's just, there's, a, there's a large time lag between the safety feature being invented and until it becomes in, into attack. So, you know, this gentleman has saved millions of lives over the past decades. But nowadays, we also have airbags. We have anti-locking brakes. So when you, when you jam on the brakes in the, on your car in an emergency, your, your wheels don't lock. You can still steer your way out of, out, of, out of harm's way. So we have all of these extra safety features coming on board. When you look at modern operating systems, we're seeing a lot more of safe, safety and security features being built into them. 20 years ago, if I wanted encrypt, to encrypt a laptop, I had to get a third-party tool to that. It was not built into the operating system. If I wanted to have antivirus software on my, my, my device, I had to get a third-party tool. Now you can get it as part of some uh, operating systems as well. You can always get third-party tools because they might be better, but they're being more and more built in and incorporated in as well. We now crash test everything. We make sure the cars are safe before they're released to the public. We do proper QA testing. Does every company do proper vulnerability testing or penetration testing of their systems before they're released online? We had, my company had a phone call last week from a company that's setting up an online health portal looking for us to deliver a pen test to them. And I said, yeah, okay, we can do that, but here's the scope, and it's going to take at least 15 days and etc. And they came back, well, phew, your competitors charging us four days. And we're going, well, yeah, I don't think you're getting a, a penetration test on four days for an online health portal. But my point that I'm trying to, to make is that are we doing proper testing of these systems before they go online? Not just cybersecurity systems, etc., but any system that people rely on. What testing is, is, is happening to make sure they're secure? And to illustrate this, this video, thanks to YouTube, just shows you a modern car in a head-on collision with the car from the 50s or 60s. Now, having a look at that, you can see that there's a lot of damage, etc., being caused. 
and have a look at this picture as a result, which driver would you prefer to be? In the modern car or in the older car? The other car might look cooler and retro and stuff like that, but you're going to walk out of a modern car, maybe not so much so, uh, the older car as well. And thanks to all these rules and regulations and insistence by governments that we have to have all these things in place, we can see this chart from the US, debt rate per 100, 100 million vehicles over the, the years, you can see has gone down all the way. You know, it's not saying that it's eliminated, and I don't think that like, risk with everything, we are not going to be able to get down to a zero figure, but we can get as close to that as we, we, we potentially can. But it's not just the cars that, and the automobiles that we have improved, the infrastructure that we have those vehicles running on have be, has become better designed and more secure. The materials going into roadways, how roundabouts, I think this is from the Netherlands, which I think are miles ahead in road safety than many countries because of the way they, they do think it's actually a pleasure to be a pedestrian or a cyclist or even a motorist going through the Netherlands, uh, uh, much more so than, than, than even, <laughs> even Ireland. But the infrastructure is more robust and better than what we have now. For you to get behind the wheel of a car, you have to have driver training. Most countries will now insist you have to have driver training. In Ireland, you have to have at least 12 lessons from a, a licensed uh, teacher on how to drive. So it's, it's not a case of jumping into, into a car with your, your father or your, your, fa your brothers or your family or whatever and learn to drive from them. You have to get official driver training. And once you get that, you actually have to get authorized by the government to be able to drive and use the roads. You have to get a driver's license to prove that you've got the proper training. And throughout your life as a driver, you're constantly reminded of what those rules and what you should be doing and, and how you should approach junctions by signs warning along the way. We don't have an equivalent on the internet. You know, we don't have stop, this is a fishing website. Well, we kind of do if you have a modern browser, but we don't have a lot of prompts or notices to users on how to be more secure on their online world. We have detections of people breaking the rules in roads. So uh, speed guns and traps, and some of them are automated. So we're kind of getting there these days now with seams and socks and stuff, but I think we do have a long way to go on it. But I think one of the biggest things to have, we have enforcement. If you break the rules and you're caught, you're probably going to get a fine or end up in court, get license uh, points deducted off your license, and you could lose your license. You could lose the ability to drive. And today, if we all decided, let's build a brand new car and take on Elon Musk and you know, have our own cyber truck, have a VB truck, let's have a forest building truck, let's build it together. This is what we have to do to get that onto the road. These are all the things we have to have in place before that vehicle is allowed to get onto the road, before it's allowed to be sold to people, before it's allowed people to have it. And even with all those things in place, as I said, it's recognized that we can't get the zero deaths or zero risk. We have good emergency response in place to help those who've made a mistake or to help those who've been victim of a failure of their system, be that their vehicle or a problem with the road, etc., to help them recover and get back, up, back going again. And things are going to change in the future. You know, the technology we have in our cars is going to become more and more complex. We're going to have more and more computers in our cars than ever before. So that means we're going to have more vulnerabilities. But, you know, it, it gives us benefits. You, you, you've got autonomous driving, all these other things that are coming through, which will bring lots of benefits, but also potential risks as well. And to deal with all this, you know, if, if we don't step back and look at what are we doing and how we do things and change how we do things, I think we're going to be making the same mistakes over and over again. I've been involved in IT, as I said, since the 1980s. 
Uh, I started off working with Wang computers and uh, HP mini computers, then moved into PCs, the first IBM PC ones, etc. So I was, I've been involved since the very start of PCs. The advice we had back then on how to secure our computers, update them regularly, install antivirus software, have secure passwords. What's the advice we give today to people? Update your, machine, your, your device regularly, use antivirus software, and use secure passwords. Are we going to be given the same advice in 10, 20, 40 years' time and still having all these cyber security incidents? Medical systems being brought down, uh, critical infrastructure being brought down because of this. We need to think differently and we need to collaborate better to fix it. The old way of how we've done things, I firmly believe we have to forget about it. We need to look at ways to work better together and to share. Because these people are coming on using technologies. They're using the systems that have been produced by manufacturers around the world. And we have to make sure that before they click a mouse or before they touch a keyboard, that those systems are safe. And this is a picture of, of a goose. Of, a, of, of geese, sorry, not of a goose, well, of geese flying. And they're flying in a V formation. And, and geese work together to get from when they're migrating. So the first goose that's leading the flight, they fly, they're guiding the way. See the last, the, the, the geese at the end? They're resting. So one of them will then come up and take over the lead. And that number one goose will work their way all the way down to the back and then potentially rotate back again. So the flock continues at a safe speed, a steady speed, and they get to where they are. We need to collaborate, I think, better as an industry ourselves, the cybersecurity industry, but also outside of cybersecurity. We need to collaborate better with regulators, with, uh, other, with software manufacturers, hardware manufacturers, so that they understand what the threats and the risks are, and that we can all work together to make it safer for everybody else. And we can sort of go, oh yeah, regulation never stopped hackers, and regulations aren't going to make things secure, and you know. I think regulation is going to happen. Whether we like it or not, these regulations are here, and there's going to be more coming. So you can be like the infamous King Canute, fighting the tide and saying, get back, get back, get back. Or you can drown. Regulation is going to be here. We need, we need to look at it. Or is somebody in this room or somebody in our industry, will somebody be the cyber needs bowling that will invent something or develop something that will protect people over the next number of decades? So I firmly believe we are living in interesting times. There's a lot of challenges that we have but we have a lot of opportunities. And I think it's the opportunities we should be looking at. I think it's an exciting time for us to be living in, and we just need to embrace those times and work with them and work together to make the world a better, secure, and more safe place for everybody. So thank you very much for your time.